You're listening to the Our Eerie Podcast with Devonna Paisley, Marty Wachuku, and Lydia Lath. We're here to highlight community voices and bring new perspectives to the table. We are unpacking Eerie's and America's baggage. We're speaking truth to power. Take a seat. Hey, y'all. Welcome back to the Our Airy podcast. In this episode, you'll be listening to a talk back with Shalani Kintaya, director of Coded Bias, which is now available on Netflix. This recording was in partnership with the Film Grain podcast of the Film Society of Northwestern PA. Tune in as the host of Our Airy share their feedback on this film and listen to the conversation about how technology is reinforcing racial biases. During my first semester at MIT, I got computer vision software that was supposed to track my face. It didn't work until I put on this white mask. I'm thinking, all right, what's going on here? Is it the lighting conditions? Is it the angle at which I'm looking at the camera? Or is there something more? That's when I started looking into issues of bias that can creep into technology. Our ideas about technology that we think are normal are actually ideas that come from a very small and homogeneous group of people. Vast amounts of data at incredible speeds. Everybody has unconscious biases, and people embed their own biases into technology. We want to say thank you to our sponsors, Celebrate Women in Tech Group here in Erie and Ben Franklin Technology Partners. Well, the Women in Tech Group is a group of women that are identifying themselves in the tech space. So they can be obviously in the uh, digital media marketing, tech, e-commerce, but we have some women engineers. And uh, so it's pretty diverse group. And uh, we were meeting pretty regularly, uh, mostly for networking. But they, um, you know, obviously during the COVID, we, we just didn't gather anymore. So i um, excited to see if things change. And then Ben Franklin Technology Partnership is uh, we invest in startups, tech startups, great ideas and innovations. Thank you for uh, helping us make this event possible. So this episode is a mashup between the Film Grain and the Ariary podcast. I'm John Lyons, filmmaker, teaching artist, and director of programming for the Film Society of Northwestern Pennsylvania. And I'm Erica Berlin. I'm the executive director of the Film Society of Northwestern PA. And I'm Mike Berlin, your cinema Lexus Nexus. Hi, I'm Marty. I'm one of the co-hosts and producers for Our Eerie. Hi, I'm Devana, and I'm also one of the co-hosts and the co-producers on Our Eerie. And I'm Lydia Lath, and I'm one of the co-hosts and co-producers of Our Eerie. You know, there's been a a growing trend, I would say, of technology documentaries recently, some on some of the major platforms. And my gripe is always, I feel like they don't go far enough. They don't go deep enough. But Coded Bias, I feel for sure, is easy to understand. It shows specific concrete examples of these applications and how they affect our daily lives. It succeeds in a wide scope, but it's also digestible at the same time. We're naive to corporate 24-7 surveillance. I know that I am. I need reminded about it all the time. Uh, Clearly, we're in the wild west of consumer integration with no values, no ideals. I feel like uh, this film is very important, and uh, that's why we programmed it, and super happy to have um, Shalani here with us. That's all I'm going to share right now. One thing that stuck out to me right at the beginning and throughout, and by the end of it, I was so shocked at my own thoughts that it was a breath of fresh air. It was so trustworthy. I found myself trusting so much and so soothed that every single expert that I heard from throughout the film was a woman. I know you did that on purpose, Shalini, and I was so grateful um, from joy through every single every single woman that that you had um, speaking to this issue, um, talking about math, the weapons of math destruction. I loved every single expert that you had, and I loved that every single one was a woman. But it also reminded me that 
we're so used to seeing, I mean, a diverse group, you know, male and female experts, um, but we're so used to hearing male voices when it comes to expertise um, that hearing all female voices was like, huh, I'm listening to all women. And that's so shocking. And yet it was 100% trusted all those voices and was soothed by hearing all female voices. So I'm looking forward to hearing other perspectives on that. Uh, I guess I'll jump in here. Uh, first things first, Shalani, I want to just say kudos on an excellent, excellent documentary. That's a huge landscape that you were covering uh, for a subject. And to pull all the stories together, particularly at the end, is just like, uh, it's it's fascinating. Uh, and it sort of reminded me of a book I read a couple of uh, years ago, uh, Homo Deus by Yuval Noah Harari. And uh, it felt like it was a missing chapter. Uh, and it, I can't help but think about what you're dealing with in the context of what you're uh, talking about in the film and thinking about what he who's, he sort of references, particularly in the later chapters of that book, from biotech and uh, bioinformation and where things are going and sort of seeing sort of the breadcrumbs starting to get placed out a little bit. And it's... Um, you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting subject because at the end of the day, it's probably, it's not over yet. Yeah, I mean, like it's, it is an ongoing evolving situation. And uh, it, it, I agree with John with, with what you said. It is an incredibly uh, um, poignant and uh, sort of really interesting film because this is happening and changing by the day. So, um, man, I hope more people get to see this movie. Excellent, excellent job. I sometimes feel overwhelmed by how many problems we face in modern society and how all of them tie to the white supremacy, the male gaze, the wealth gaze. And in my little sphere feeling like I can't address everything and I hope that people are addressing it where they can. So it felt really comforting that this thing that worries me, how my data is being used, how my, my face is being used or not being recognized and how if I go apply for rent or something, what kind of code may be working against me and hearing it in such a digestible way by someone who looked like me for most of the movie, like felt really, really good. And by the end, seeing the action that was taken and how it helped people directly was really powerful. It is a continuing fight, but it's good to know that there are people fighting this fight and um, making people like myself who don't think about it every day aware of it. And it impacts me, like it will impact how I um, move in my day-to-day -day life on the socials and shopping and around cameras. And I think it's something that we all have to be way more conscious of. So those are my first initial thoughts when I finished up. I'm still processing um, all uh, everybody's like comments, but I will say my very first, I'm, I mean, I'm gonna be real transparent. My very first expression was wow like a black woman saved us like and it did we didn't even realize it like you know like you I think that the term with, with ignorance is bliss is rather interesting because I was just like whoa which ignorance is not bliss for you know I don't know how you know I'm just kind of like realizing that I was so ignorant to the fact that I everywhere you do look, we're using a screen and they are taking different things from uh, what we're, so it's just, I was ignorant to that and not really thinking about that and watching that really opened my mind to be like, oh my God, now I have to like be more aware of, you know, this issue. But the fact that like, she so eloquently just brought it to the point where it's like, this was, this is a problem we need to adjust it. We need to fix it. Like I, I just was blown away. I, my, that's my first, that was my first initial like thought, like, wow, I was really ignorant to all this. You know, I have Alexis and now I'm just, I look at my Alexis sideways, like, oh my God, like, you know, so I think that it's, it was just, it, it was an eye opener. It was a really, it was a big eye opener for me. I have a pit in my stomach right now thinking about one aspect of it and John you you touched on it briefly but about this idea of like it's a the wild west and this kind of like no rules and that's what it scares me the most because this isn't the only space in which it's the wild west where there's like so little regulation so little accountability in the context of of Dante Wright's recent murder like I can't help but feel like we we have a, a duty we have a responsibility to to regulate these things that can be so harmful to hold people accountable to to better standards to not be so passive in our privilege or in our 
ignorance to think that that we can't change this or that it's you know like this this idea that tech is is unbiased i i thought that was like so powerful because there's so much of white supremacist ideas that get rooted in quote unquote science that then kind of get absolved of any sort of moral accountability and so I, yeah i just i loved that framework and thinking about as someone like running for local office and for someone that is like you know involved in community organizing and and work like that what can we be doing on a policy level to protect people i think is huge and that's like at the forefront of my mind thanks lydia and thanks to all of our hosts for these initial thoughts and you know now um we put all this on you so many ideas (laughs) so many thoughts so let's open up to you shalini I mean, now that you've heard all of this, let's turn it over to you. So what do you think after hearing all of this? You've been talking about your film for over a year. It came out last year. Where are you right now after hearing all this and everyone's thoughts? Well, this totally felt like an episode of This Is Your Life. (laughs) So thank you so much for all of those incredibly thoughtful comments. You know, I think I'm so grateful to hear them because the journey that you went on watching the film, I actually went on making the film and I had all of those same feelings and reactions. I mean, I um, I don't have a science background. I um, am not a data scientist. I don't have advanced degrees in mathematics. And three years ago, I didn't even know what an algorithm even was. And you know, my street cred is that I'm a sci-fi fanatic. And so everything that I knew about artificial intelligence had sort of come through the mind of of Steven Spielberg or Stanley Kubrick or Ridley Scott. And I don't really think it sort of prepared me to understand the way in which AI is being used in the now. And I think I was alongside you incredibly alarmed to understand the ways in which we are outsourcing our decision-making to machines and that, you know, algorithms, AI, uh, machine learning, it's becoming this gatekeeper of opportunity, you know, really deciding things like who gets hired, who gets healthcare, um, even how long a prison sentence someone serves. I stumbled down the rabbit hole when I read the book, Weapons of Math Destruction, and um, subsequently algorithms of oppression and saw the TED talk that Joy Bill and Weenie gave and realized that these same systems that we're trusting with decisions that really change human destiny um, have not been vetted for racial bias or for gender bias or that they won't hurt people. And um, I realized that Oftentimes they haven't even been vetted for some standard of accuracy that we've all agreed upon together, you know, outside from the company that stands to benefit economically. And that kind of set me on the journey to make this film. And um, you are so right about loving, you know, I have to say that I didn't really realize what a revolutionary act it was to uh, create a film that was mostly women and people of color. And it, I think I've had 400 screenings and at all 400 of them, people have made a comment about that. And I think you're right when it comes to technology, um, we'll watch a film with all men in it and not bat an eyelash. And so it's my hope that I'm, I'm really grateful for the comment, but I also hope the next time we see a film that has all male voices in it, that we'll also say, well, wait a minute, was that a choice that you made? <laughs> and I think that, For me, um, it is really significant. I think um, what Devana said about three Black women saving the nation or saving the Republic, um, it's not the first time. We just all hope that it's not the last time. (laughs) And I think that um, in this particular case, I really saw that three Black women graduate students, Joy Bellamwini, Tim Netgebru, and Deborah Raji, you know, found bias in facial recognition technologies that were already being sold to the FBI, already being sold to ICE, already being sold to police departments and deployed oftentimes in um, in secret with no one that we elected giving any kind of oversight. And I do find that I feel a debt of gratitude to these women. Um, and I think that... Um, 
what is common to the cast of my film is not only are they some of the smartest human beings that I've ever spoken to in my life, you know, advanced degrees in uh, data science and mathematics from Harvard and MIT and uh, everywhere, but they also had an identity that was marginalized. Uh, they were women, they were people of color, they were LGBTQ, um, they were religious minorities. And I think that is because that gave them a perspective. Um, being from a, having an experience that was marginalized gave them a perspective where they were able to shine a light into the blind spots that Silicon Valley missed. And I think that speaks to um, the importance of inclusion in the development of these technologies that are deployed on the world. And not just because, you know, it's good for the pictures and it's good for the communities that have been historically discriminated against, but because it's absolutely integral to creating innovative technologies uh, when you're designing for the world. And when you have an industry like AI, where 14% of the researchers are women, which is abysmal and calls for what I hope ends up being a massive investment um, in women in, this, in these fields, half the genius um, from the conversation has been missing. And that means that I think that we've had a stunning lack of imagination about how these systems could work. And um, I'm so grateful to all of you for, for saying it, 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 it's accessible because, you know, I have to say as a, as a filmmaker, starting out with no degrees in this stuff, I, I felt an, an amazing imposter syndrome when I first started making this film. And I was terrified. And I thought I'm going to misuse the word algorithm <laughs> or, you know, say something incorrectly and everyone's going to laugh at my research and I'm going to be dismissed. And I've now sat with every major tech company in the U.S. and the people who make self-driving cars and they're interested in what I have to say. And I think that that is a sign that the reason that you know, those of us who feel, who have that imposter syndrome, who feel like we don't belong, it underscores the importance to have us sitting at the table mm -hmm. and that we have a perspective that people are missing. And what I hope Coded Bias does is pull up a chair for all of us and say, we all have a seat at the table because these um, technologies are deployed on all of us. And the other thing I just learned in the making this film that I, that I have tremendous compassion for is that bias is just not in a few bad people. And it's not just in um, you know, white guys in Silicon Valley, but bias is an inherent human condition that we all have and that we are oftentimes unconscious about. And that actually means that we need each other. Um, to shine a light into each other's bias and it becomes something that we all need to be vigilant about when we're designing for the future. And I think that's something that I learned in the, in the making of this film and a lot more compassion for human beings. I'm going to sort of backtrack a little bit. Uh, and again, you sort of you really cover an international scope here in your, uh, as in the process of making the documentary, did you find a little bit that we are, as we're advancing a little bit, uh, particularly with this technology, um, each culture is starting to develop a different relationship with the algorithms and with the technology. And can you speak to that a little bit? Absolutely. I think in the film, I really tried to show three different approaches to data protection. Um, you have China, which is sort of like the Black Mirror episode inside of the documentary. And it's sort of what happens when an authoritarian regime has unfettered access to your data. And um, 
And I show this sort of skateboarder. I, I think it's important to know it probably would have been dangerous for me to film someone who was critical of the facial recognition system, but she really trusts it and says, I don't need to get to know anyone. Um, I, I can just work from their social credit score. And I think that that was really important for me to show because I think, you know, how many times have we all had a moment where we judge someone based on the Instagram followers they have or um, wanted to delete something because not enough people like the post. And it speaks to what Kathy O'Neill calls algorithmic obedience training, the way that our behavior is being reshaped by this new Pavlov's bell, you know, this algorithmic reward system. And I think like we think of, you know, China as a galaxy far, far away. But I feel like she sort of speaks to an impulse we all have. I mean, I look at that and say like, wow, cool. I could buy a candy bar with my face. <laughs> you know, like, I could pay for dinner with my face. How amazing would that be um, without really thinking about what we're giving up in this race to efficiency and the sort of implications of it. And I think that's why China was really important. I also show the UK, which at the time was part of Europe when I was filming. They have the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regimen, which to me is the world's right now our model for what data rights look in a civil rights framework, what data rights look like in a human rights framework. It is the beginning, and I hope um, those legislations will only strengthen of transparency and bringing the sort of rights of people back into play with big tech. And I think it's really important to say that, you know, two of those scenes that I filmed could really only be filmed in the UK because in the US, there's no process that would make police use of facial recognition transparent to me. So I actually had to go to the UK where they have some laws that make that process transparent, where I could film that process. And, and even where they have laws, I think you see the moments where you overstep, where you see a, a UK citizen, you know, pulling their shirt over their face and, um, and getting ticketed by the police as suspicious behavior. And I sort of uh, use a parallel in apartheid South Africa to remind us that free people in a democracy are not actually supposed to be um, stopped arbitrarily by police and asked for ID. That's actually not supposed to happen in a free society. And I, and I wanted to draw that parallel to remind us that that's not supposed to happen. Um, but that's exactly what's happening with police use of facial recognition. And then you have the US where we have no laws whatsoever. Um, you know, uh, we have some laws for children and then every other law that we have that would govern these technologies was created before the advent of the internet. <laughs> and um, as we're home to a lot of these big tech companies, I've seen how they can uh, run roughshod over our democracy. And I also see how you know, I, I'm so grateful to the to the brilliant and brave cast of the film for giving me an education, because now I can sort of look at technology and have some understanding of what AI can do and what it can't do. And I think because we don't have basic literacy either in this country around how these systems work, you know, we believe that it can do stuff it can't do. Um, you know, judge if a teacher is a good teacher. Um, judge if law enforcement should go back to a certain community. And I can now look at that and be like, that's total pseudoscience. Mm -hmm. um, that's complete bogus science. You can't judge if a teacher is a good teacher uh, based on this. Are, you, are we just saying that it's just scoring that matters if a teacher is a good teacher? Um, if I, I live, you know, 10 minutes from Wall Street, I can tell you that we don't have crime data we have arrest data, which is really different. And so if we are, you know, judging places that have been over police to where we're gonna send police in the future, the same sort of communities get over policed. Um, 
you know, when you have a system like HireVue that says it can judge based on your facial expressions, who's going to make a good employee? This is all pseudoscience. And then all of a sudden, someone who has Botox sues them <laughs> because they they like they say that the they uh, the the algorithm says that she's aggressive. <laughs> And so it, it just goes to show that I feel like we're living in a wild, wild west, both without policy and without literacy. And those two things give so much power to big tech companies um, to run roughshod. And um, it's my hope that literacy is the first step. And I hope that Coded Bias will be um, and is the first of many films um, to educate the public about how these systems work and to start new conversations that engage all of us in, in uh, what it would look, look like to actually regulate them. And I just, I just want to start, uh, you know, put a pin in that by saying, you know, in these technologies, it's kind of like, the automobile before we had seat belts, before you had a car seat for your baby. It's like a pharmaceutical product with no labels or usage directions. And um, it's my hope that we'll actually get some regulation that would put some health and safety measures um, in for the public to protect us against these predatory algorithms. Hi, Shalani. First of all, uh, thank you uh, for the newly growing pit in my stomach. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, um, it, it occurred to me uh, uh, as I was watching it that what you were really talking about are what we um, what we in the social sciences call epistemologies, ways of knowing. Mm -hmm. um, and so what the film pointed out to me was that our primary way of knowing um, is both rooted in um, a bias towards whiteness richness and maleness, and that it is um, encoded, not just in the technology that you talk about, but it's encoded in our thinking, right? Um, so for instance, when we talk about getting rid of racial slurs, well, we should just stop using racial slurs and then you know, we won't have to worry, it'll decrease racism. It won't because the thought exists that led to the creation of the racist word. And so what, you, what you've what you done is you've indicated to us, this is so deep rooted um, that, that technology cannot be ex exempt from it because technology is created by these people who are rooted in these specific ways of knowing. For me, when I think about it, I, when, when I think about it that way, it becomes a much bigger issue because now it means that you, you know, we've got to go to the beginning and retrain people, re-socialize people from the beginning. And, um, you know, I began to wonder how we could do that because you talk about pseudoscience, but uh, just about everything that we do is based in some sort of pseudoscience still, right? The body, Lombroso's research on criminality and body type. You can tell who's going to be able to, who's going to commit more crimes by their body type. Um, lumps on heads, you, you know, uh, women are the weaker sex, those kinds of things. They're so deeply embedded in what we're, how we think, which shows up in your, um, in your documentary. So here's, here's my question. How do you proceed from here? Because I noticed that in the film, Timnit uh, Gebru is in it. Was this before or after she was fired by Google? Before. Okay. So her being there before she was fired, knowing now what we know from your documentary, then she gets fired, seems to me to be a signal that at least one of the big tech companies really doesn't care um, about the kinds of things that um, that the scholars in your documentary talk about. So where where do you go from this point? Thank you, Rhonda, for such a, um, a thoughtful question and for reminding me of the word epistemology, ways of knowing, because what does it mean when Google is 90% of the information searches globally throughout the world. 
um, talk about ways of knowing. Um, there is an entire generation growing up thinking that Google is an encyclopedia. And I, I literally have to, uh, some uh, college students that work with me, I have to teach them like, this is not the encyclopedia. If we're doing journalism, you need to go to a library. We need two sources that don't come from Google, which is an advertising platform and not an encyclopedia. And I think what you're saying is so powerful when you talk about ways of knowing as a human being, because I think um, even aside from bias, we have not yet, you know, sort of examined this sort of invisible hand, this sort of nudge. I mean, I grew up in, in a generation where the DJ chose the next song. It was your resident selector that changed the chose the next song. We had, I'm aging myself here, like curated spaces to look for films, you know what I mean? Like, and, um, you know, like a Kim's video, someplace that you would go and know that someone, some human had done a thoughtful curation of, of um, epistemology, ways of knowing a curated space, and you could trust those spaces. And I think now we have not yet examined what it means when we constantly have that invisible hand in our lives of the algorithm saying, would you like to watch this next? Would you like to look for this next? Do you wanna hear this song next? And what that does to even human free will, much less what it means about what we're learning about um, race and class and gender and all of those other things. The where we go from here, and I think Dr. Timnit Gebru's firing from Google, one of few Black AI ethicists from Google, sent a chilling effect through the industry. And if I was heartened by anything, it was that 2,500 of her coworkers staged a virtual walkout, signed a petition, and that there were actually uh, resignations in the wake of her firing. And I think that sent a chilling effect to the community around the fact that we can no longer trust big tech to regulate themselves. These companies have gotten too big for democracies to function. And even when I interviewed um, Latanya Sweeney of the FTC, there's a kind of a companion piece that, that's airing on Nova tonight um, with, with Dr. Sophia Noble and Dr. Latanya Sweeney, who used to lead the FTC. And she talks about how we're entering an age that can be described as a technocracy, that technology companies are actually rewriting the rules of democratic process. Uh, and we expect to have the same rights of a democracy when we post something on Facebook, and yet we don't. <laughs> And so um, what I really have come to believe is that quite what Joy Balamwini articulates so clearly in the film, which is that civil rights, data rights are the unfinished work of the civil rights movement. And that when I look at how this gets done, this gets done the same way the civil rights movement gets done, which is that we didn't look to policymakers to all of a sudden uh, give women equal uh, rights in the, um, to employment. We didn't look to policymakers to suddenly desegregate our, our schools and, 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 and give people of color uh, the right to vote um, in, in um, places where it was on, on the books, but we still didn't have our rights. It, it happened through people getting educated, and participating in our government and letting our voices be heard. And I think the same thing has to happen here. That um, the first step is a massive literacy like we've never seen before um, in terms of a 10 year old's gonna start using a phone in the fifth grade. It's at that age that they should start learning about where their data is going, how it's making predictions about them, why their Google search says something than someone in a different zip code, why their ad says something than, than in a different zip code. I think all of this literacy leads to people being able to be critical and to question this power 
that we've never seen before in our society, this kind of opaque, invisible power. And um, the, what I've seen is that the places that are most literate about these how these systems work are actually the first to pass policy. So uh, San Francisco, Oakland, um, Cambridge, Boston, all technological hubs where they know how facial recognition works have been the first to ban them <laughs> by their police and in their communities. And that says a lot about how the rest of us should be um, thinking about these technologies. And so to me, the first step is literacy. And the second step is letting our policymakers know. I've gotten in the habit where sometimes I want to post something to the echo chamber in Twitter. And I'm like, you know what? Let me hit up Schumer and Gillibrand real quick. And let them know how I'm feeling today. <laughs> and I think the more that we can sort of, it takes the same amount of time, to be honest. And I know that every time they get a note like that, they, they, their staffers hit a wand, one for AI rights, one for AI literacy. They get a thousand, a couple thousand people of their constituents. They have a problem on their hands that they need to address. And so I think the more that we can flex that muscle, it really matters. The other thing that I really think is um, important while we're, while we're thinking about making systematic change, because we're now in a situation where we can't opt out of these systems, no tape. And on our cameras is going to save us. Um, you know, this is the only way we can be together is through these technolo technological platforms today is um, supporting an organization that's working on these issues. And you can go to codedbias.com backslash take action and you'll find heroic organizations like the ACLU, the Algorithmic Justice League, Mi Gente, Color of Change, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, and so many others that are literally fighting for these rights um, in ways that really change policy and make a difference. I have a, just to refer to the end of the film, um, so you talk about literacy and policy, um, but at the end of the film, you talk about the algorithm and knowledge and ethics and the idea that maybe just like uh, in 16 hours, you know, the Internet could teach um, a Twitter bot to, you know, be racist and <laughs> be horrible, um, that potentially um, an algorithm can be taught ethics and become good and be better, right? And that maybe it's possible. And to use a reference to a film, um, because this is the film society, um, the in the movie Her, you know, the, the, uh, the man who is lonely, he starts a relationship with, um, with a bot, with an algorithm that is created in, to be a companion to him, to serve him. Um, and in the end, the, the bot, the algorithm ends up saying, Hey, I'm going to go off and be on my own. Like I'm, I'm joining this revolution and we are leaving. We're not going to serve you anymore. And that's a bit like, you know, Hal in 2001, he kind of turns on, he turns on folks, but, you know, thinking into the future, is it even, is it possible to, to, um, for an algorithm to be good, to become ethical, um, is it is it possible for us to create an algorithm that actually becomes ethical? And and is that possible for for humans, for the people who create the technology? I mean, an ethicist, you know, we just talked about and I'm sorry that I that I can't remember her name, the eth ethicist at Google who lost her job um, that Rhonda, you know, you you brought up as well. Um, you know, she lost her job for being an ethicist. And, um, you know, is, is ethics part of the solution? Is it possible to, to create um, a knowledgeable and ethical algorithm? Well, I appreciate the question and I always appreciate science fiction references. <laughs> and it, it also speaks to the fact that our science fiction imagination around artificial intelligence has also been dominated by men because I promise True. you I have never ever had a fantasy about having a romance with an AI, but that seems to be a dominant 
theme in science fiction um, created by men um, because women are very complicated human women um, but but I will say that um, you know in the making of this film I have thought a lot about what intelligence means and I thought a lot about what it means to be human and what the goal of being human is and I think I am with Meredith Broussard, um, the author of Artificial and Intelligence, in questioning this thing we're calling intelligent. And if the Ray Kurzweil's of the world are correct, and in a you know in a certain amount of time we'll have singularity theory, and all of human knowledge will be in a robot. Um, what makes us human? And I decided that intelligence has something to do with empathy and has something to do with compassion. And can we even have a system that we call intelligent that is not compassionate and that is not empathetic? And I don't think that we can. Um, and I think that oftentimes, I think technologists often think like, oh, it was just bad data. We'll just create a better data set and we'll have this perfect super intelligence that will run society. And I think that for me, it's not about creating the perfect algorithm. It's about creating a more humane society. And sometimes I, by the way these technology companies are framed, I've questioned, you know, what's the goal of human civilization? Is it to go as fast as possible? Is it to be as efficient as possible? And um, is that the goal of our lives, just to go faster and faster? Or is it actually to build a civilization that values um, the inherent dignity of every human being? And if it's the latter, then we need to think radically differently about how we design technological systems. And that might mean in certain cases that you don't even use the algorithm. You don't even use AI, uh, which I think could be controversial, you know, to some technology people. But I think human-centered design is about, you know, how Kathy O'Neill frames the question is, for whom could the system fail? What are the stakes if that system fails? And how easy is it to, to correct that error? Um, how easy is it to get a human being on the phone and say, uh, there's a mistake. The machine made a mistake about me. I wasn't supposed to be weeded out of the applicants. Um, and a lot of times, all of those things are opaque and invisible to us and sort of are pushing us on pathways controlled by power. And so to me, it really is not about creating um, the perfect algorithm, but creating a more human-centered um, and ethical society, which means sometimes the machines have to be subservient to us and not the other way around. It's a little question, not even really a question, but what you were just saying triggered the part of the movie and I forgot in the gentleman's lame from the Soviet era. And I had heard that story before of how there was code or something warning him that there had been a missile launched and he deciding not to do that. And watching that made me very scared. Is there code right now that exists that could lead to something that detrimental that we have AI making decisions for us right now. Oh, thank you for that. I, that was a scene I really debated about putting in the film. I was like, this seems like such a crazy little scene. And we made the Soviet Union really cheaply. <laughs> At the end of the film, you see these like sort of graphic elements. And those are actually my lighting people standing in for Russians. I was like, you have a little beard, you have the fedora, let's just get in close. <laughs> no one will ever know. Um, but that scene was really important to me because it speaks the importance of having a human in the loop, that we can't let these machines make such important decisions about who lives and who dies. And um, I'm not aware of how that, you know, of how our security is set up right now, but it's my hope that we always have a human in the loop, that we always have someone sitting on that red button and um, not leaving it to machines because machines 
are not empathetic. They're not moral. They're not ethical. Um, and they can't stand in for our human, our humanity. Yeah, it's all so fascinating, Jelani. I mean, it, it really, truly is something that's always interested me and privacy has always been a big issue. Um, but I come, you know, my, my background goes way back to direct marketing. And uh, I remember like our, our local supermarket, um, Wegmans, you know, you were getting coupons and everything based on the products that you bought, right? And people were freaking out over that because the, it was such an invasion of privacy. Like, I don't want the mailman knowing I'm buying this, you know, or whatever, you know, so depends or something, right? <laughs> and, um, and, you know, and then when email, I, you know, I was, we do email marketing and digital marketing. And the, uh, in 1984, Congress enacted the Can Spam Act. And I think that's probably the last legislation that's been significant which really isn't that significant when you think about what's going on now. But back to the legislation and you, you, you know, you've mentioned the talk back or the, the take back and it was mentioned in the film too, but I follow someone else who, you know, has watched all of these tech companies talking to Congress and what they say, you know, I mean, wherever there's money involved that you just cannot trust them. And they've, this, the, the guy that I follow, Rand, he he was he's just a brilliant man, but he has pointed out how they are already, you know, whatever they said and, and was written down in Congress, they've already broken the rules and not following it. And you brought up, you know, the um, Cambridge Analytica and those things are still going on and, and Google, everything now they're saying zero click, hardly anything, everything's going on their servers. The legislation, I mean, we, you know, they have it for broadcast television. We, we must absolutely, you know, push on the legislators, speak up, lean in, lean on to get that power, you know, put some restrictions on them. You know, I mean, that's just what we have to do. You know, the, the organizations and the movement that you're part of is, you know, I, my, my question really is the vigilance, you know. The vigilance in terms of do we donate? Do we organize? Do we, you know, do we just keep talking? The answer to all those questions is yes. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. It's going to take all of us. I, I am um, a believer. My activism is all about we all have a garden patch of influence that we can make in the world. All of our garden patches look a little different. Um, it's our sphere of influence where we can make change. And I think that, um, you know, there's a lot of um, pressure now around the kind of predatory advertising that's happening. We all um, have a moment where I was having a private conversation about the Grand Canyon. And all of a sudden I realized Instagram had like jacked into my phone and my microphone when I'm having a private conversation. So it could DM me and the, the the horrible way it made me feel when um, I was like, I gave you that so I could share a picture and not so you could jack into my phone when I'm having a private conversation with a colleague so you can direct and listen to me all the time so you can direct market it to me. And um, I think there's some, um, there is, I think it's the Center for Commercial Free Childhood is um, just lodged a complaint um, to the FTC around this, around children and what this is sort of doing to children, this sort of predatory marketing. But the truth is we need all of it. And, and I, and I actually think that our biggest obstacle is not actually big tech, although they are a hell of an obstacle. <laughs> I mean, in terms of, I've never seen power like this, um, in terms of the lobby dollars in, uh, in liberal politics, the lobby dollars in conservative politics, um, the money that they're putting into computer science universities that teach this stuff, uh, big tech money is in everything. And I think that it's gonna take all of us. I just wanna say that I, I um, you know, I'm a black turtleneck wearing New Yorker and I am very unromantic about social change. But I will say that I make documentaries because they remind me that um, superheroes among us don't always wear capes. 
and that um, everyday people can make a difference. And as much as I apologize for the pit in your um, stomachs that you've all spoken about that the film has given you, I hope it's also given you some hope. Um, because there are those stories of not just the people who went to MIT and Harvard, but uh, people like Silky Carlo. There are three people in sitting, three young people in an office at Big Brother Watch in London, single handedly holding back real time um, facial recognition by police in, in London. Um, uh, Trine Moran and Icy May Downs not only kept facial recognition from being installed by their landlord, but they inspired the first policy in the state of New York that would help other people from doing the same. Um, Daniel Santos um, not only won his case um, and set this president that you can't discriminate against teachers, you can't fire a teacher or put a teacher on um, you know, some list for disciplinary action based on an algorithm that is black box and denies them their due process under the law. And these people did not know how these systems work, but they got educated. They educated their friends and their neighbors and their communities and their colleagues. Um, and they um, did something. And so to me, um, you know, I have met very many conscientious um, people who are working within these technology companies. And what they need is pressure from us on the outside. Um, they need to hear our voices. And so I think our biggest obstacle is believing that we can make a difference and knowing how powerful we are when we take action and cultivate our gar garden patch around the things that we care about. And um, so I, I believe that we are in a moonshot moment to call for greater ethics and humanity in the technologies that will ultimately shape our future and that the cement is still wet and it's not too late for us to sort of encode these technologies with our values. And I, th I think that I actually have to leave it there because we're just about at time. Thank That's you right. so much for being here. <laughs> Excellent. It was such an honor to speak with all of you. Thank you so much for this conversation. Yes, thank you. Thank you for doing the documentary. It was just uh, fascinating. And uh, thank you. Thank you. Right well, into it. <laughs> engaging conversations like this one give my life meaning. So thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Take care. Good night. Take care. Thanks, John and Erica and Film Society and everyone else. <laughs> thanks everybody thank you. yeah thanks for joining us you've been listening to the Art Erie podcast community voices unpacking Erie's baggage and speaking truth to power you can continue the conversation on Facebook Instagram or Twitter at our Erie series funding provided by United Way of Erie and Ember and Forge music produced by Light Shadow we appreciate you for listening to the Art Erie podcast until next time take care of yourself keep fighting the good fight peace